Welcome to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. My name is Gretchen Skidmore, and I am the museum's director of education initiatives. Thank you for making time to join us today for this program, whether you're here in Washington or tuning in online. We are very pleased today to mark the release of a new book published by Knopf in association with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum titled The Unwanted, America, Auschwitz, and a Village Caught in Between. This very special book that you will learn more about today recreates the experiences of several Jewish families from the village of Kippenheim as they realize they must leave Germany and it follows their lives and their struggles navigating the restrictive U.S. immigration process of the 1930s and 1940s. The museum decided more than five years ago to commemorate its 25th anniversary by launching an educational initiative, honoring the founding documents of the museum, which stated that the American aspects of the Holocaust must be explored thoroughly and honestly. The Unwanted is part of that educational initiative. It also consists of this special exhibition here at the museum, and there's a version online, called Americans in the Holocaust. This explores the motives and the pressures and the fears that shaped Americans' responses, not only to Nazism, but to the war, as well as to the persecution of Jews. Overall, the initiative seeks to dispel myths, including that Americans were either uninformed about or totally indifferent to the threats posed by Nazism. It explores the many ways that the American people and the United States government did and did not confront Nazism, and asks why saving Jews targeted for murder never became a priority for the United States. The museum's goal is to motivate our audiences to think critically about this history and to consider how it can inform our roles and responsibilities today. In his work on the book, Michael Dobbs, examined an extraordinary collection of archival photos, records, and letters. He skillfully brings us to the daily lives, to the dreams, and to the fears of families called Vol named Wolfer, Wachenheimer, Meyer, and others. They sought desperately to escape Nazi brutality, and the research helps us understand how US policies influence the lives of people in this one community in one village, and it really reminds us of the power of individuals, institutions, and nations in a time of crisis. So during today's program, our panel will discuss the experiences of the families of Kippenheim, and they'll also take your questions. Here in the theater, ushers will collect index cards, and if you're watching online, please share your reflections and questions for the panel by tagging the museum, or using hashtag the unwanted or hashtag USHMM. Afterwards, Michael Dobbs will be available for book signing outside of our theater. He will also travel across the country in the coming months and discuss the book, and you can find those events on the museum's calendar. So let's meet our special guest today. Michael Dobbs is the author of The Unwanted and a researcher at the museum. He is a former Washington Post reporter and the author of the trilogy of Cold War books, including One Minute to Midnight. Kurt Meyer is a survivor of the Holocaust and a former resident of Kippenheim. He was just 10 years old when his family was driven from their home and their experiences are prominently featured in The Unwanted. At age 97, Kurt is also one of the longest serving employees at the National Library of Congress, where he is a translator of German texts. They are joined on stage by today's moderator, Mike Abramowitz. Mike is the president of Freedom House, a bipartisan, non-governmental organization to champion the expansion of freedom and democracy around the world. Freedom House was founded in 1941 to encourage US involvement in World War II at a time when isolationist views were dominating the American debate. Mike is also the former director of our Levine Institute for Holocaust Education my former boss, and he set the vision for this initiative early on, including for this book, helping us introduce this special story to so many people in the United States and abroad. So Mike, I will turn it over to you. 
Well, thank you, Gretchen. It's a thrill to be back at the museum, and it's a real honor to be here with Michael and Kurt. Welcome, everybody. Uh, Michael, I've, I've known you for quite, quite a bit of time, uh, and uh, your book is beautifully written, so congratulations on the book, and I uh, hope many of you have a chance to, to read this, uh, and Michael will be out signing copies of it after our session. But you have been someone who over your career has tackled big subjects, often subjects that have been you know, picked over by other journalists or historians, and clearly there are hundreds, if not thousands, of other books about the Holocaust in general, but also many very good books about this particular period of time and about the issue of how did, uh, how did America respond to the refugee crisis of the late 1930s and early 40s. So tell us why you chose to focus on this subject and how you came to this subject. Right. Uh, well, I'd been working on the Americans and the Holocaust exhibit, which you can see outside the, the theater here. Uh, and one of the main themes of the exhibit is this question of refuge. Did the United States supply refuge, or what did the United, how did the United States respond to this huge refugee crisis that gripped Europe in the late 1930s, um, largely as a result of Hitler's persecution of the Jews in Germany? Um, so I wanted to write a book about that. I'd written five books before, so I automatically began thinking of writing a book and as you say, the, a number of books have been written about the subject. Um, but I wanted to tell the story from the uh, point of view of a single German Jewish community. And I ended up, for reasons I can explain later, choosing the little village of Kippenheim uh, on the edge of the Black Forest in southwest Germany. Uh, it had a, uh, originally, back when Hitler came to power, I think there were about 100 Jews in the village. By 1938, there were, many, there were fewer. But um, particularly most of these Jews, particularly after Kristallnacht, which was the terrible moment um, it, in November 1938, when violence was unleashed against Jews of Germany for the first time, uh, they re everybody realized that they had to get out of Germany. There was no alternative. And in the end, the alternatives became narrower and narrower. They'd all applied for visas to come to the United States. And uh, so the real story that the book tells is do they succeed in reaching the United States? Or in many cases, they ended up in Auschwitz. Right. And this depended whether or not they reached the United States, depended in many cases on whether they succeeded in getting what the American journalist Dorothy Thompson talked about at the time as a piece of paper with a stamp on it, which meant the difference between life and death. This piece of paper was, of course, an American visa. So the book is about the quest for American visas and the fates of people who either received visas or didn't receive visas. So it's really the merger of the human story of the families of Kippenheim with a kind of more bureaucratic story right. that, uh, from Washington, D.C. that you're trying to merge together, which is what you take as what's different in some ways about your book. Exactly. I think that a lot of books have been written about U.S. immigration policy, refugee policy in the 1930s under President Roosevelt, but they look at it essentially as a Washington story. And I, that is one of the storylines in my book, but I wanted to connect uh, the story of what was happening in Washington with what was happening to people on the ground who were affected by US policy in a very dramatic way. So I'm going to bring Kurt into this in a moment, but just say a little bit more about how you picked Kippenheim as a place that you want to write about. How did you come to this story? Right. Um, well, there are, uh, I think, 4,000 Jewish communities across Europe that uh, were destroyed as part of the Holocaust. I could have picked any of them. Um, I became interested in uh, probably I didn't know at the time, and probably many of you didn't know, uh, was that there was a deportation um, not to the east, uh, but to the west in October 1940. There was what we would call today an ethnic cleansing of a large section of southwest Germany in which uh, the uh, Jewish populations were forcibly put on trucks, taken to um, uh, railway stations, 
and dumped across the border in unoccupied France. Actually, this is October 1940. In June of 1940, uh, the Germans had invaded France, occupied France, split it into two sectors, occupied France and unoccupied France, Vichy France. So they just took all these Jews from many villages in, um, in Baden, state of uh, southwest Germany, put them on trains, sent them to France, and the French put them in camps in France, one camp in particular uh, called uh, Gers. Uh, and then the question, they'd all, all these people were wanting, were still in line for uh, US visas, in fact. So they continued, they'd applied in, back in Germany, but once they got to France, they continued their quest for American visas. Okay, so Kurt, tell us a little bit about Kippenheim. You were 10 years old when you were deported, but tell us a little bit about what the town was like when you were growing up. Uh, when we left Kippenheim in 1940, the uh, population was 1,900. <laughs> Very small farming community. Uh, a lot of the uh, Jewish uh, men there were cattle dealers they were and horse dealers. And um, others went from house to house, what we would call peddling, or uh, door-to-door salesmen with uh, clothing and uh, uh, items uh, for the house. And uh, it was a very uh, small uh, community. Uh, the Jews were very, uh, lived very close to each other, even though there was no ghetto. They were spread out in, in the town. But uh, we had a synagogue, and um, everyone uh, more or less went to the synagogue uh, on the Sabbath and holidays. It was a peaceful uh, community. How was your family treated by the other, how were the Jews of the town treated by the other villagers? Uh, actually, um, there was a little, n there was not too much anti-Semitism uh, in the village itself. Uh, as a child, I experienced it um, just, um, if I could have the time to, um, I, my mother sent me to the house of neighbors, farmers, who, uh, and, and said, uh, uh, here's some money, uh, go to the woman in the house and buy parsley, we need parsley for the soup. So I went to buy it, and the woman uh, uh, went into the garden, and I stood by the living room door, and I saw men sitting there, and I, I was six, seven years old, and the man said, one man said to another, here's this little Jew boy with money. Uh, that's how the Jews want to make us rich, with a 25 pfennig. Uh, I was um, seven years old, but I understood that. That was my first real experience with uh, anti-Semitism. So one thing I can't resist, but I do want to ask you that in the book, Michael writes about the fact that Adolf Hitler actually came to your village uh, one day uh, when, you were, when you were a kid. Do you remember that? Uh, yes, he was driving through the, uh, in southwest Germany, inspecting fortifications. And we heard Hitler is coming through. Jews better keep all the windows closed and the blinds drawn. Uh, don't even stand by the window. But I, as a uh, eight or nine-year-old boy, went on the street and I saw him quickly pass by in an open car with the motorized uh, police. And just for a second, I had the same experience as when I read history books. People who had seen Hitler, they say. When I saw him just pass by, he was looking right at me, and I remember him looking at me. He had these hypnotic eyes, and um, had the same experience as uh, German uh, people on the street. Hitler looked right at me, they said. Hmm. Uh, so, so you were 10 years old when the Gestapo, and I think the German and other police came to uh, basically arrest all the, the Jews in your town and, and, and send you to the, to the West, as Michael was saying. Just describe what happened that day. What, uh, what, what do you remember? Uh, well, actually, my brother and I were in a Jewish school in Freiburg, about 30 miles away. And uh, my parents, when they found out uh, that we have to get to, uh, they're going to pick us up in a few hours, they sent a taxi to 
Freiburg, 30 miles away, and the man found us, picked us up, and took us back to Kippenheim. And I remember my grandmother and grandfather sitting in the living room, and my grandmother was uh, with a big bundle of uh, laundry she stuffed in a pillowcase. And she sat there, uh, not saying a word, but she, she didn't have a suitcase, so she stuffed all her clothing into this uh, pillowcase. And uh, then the police came and said, everybody outside, leave the key stuck in the door. Yeah, this is a photograph of the, this actual moment. Um, yeah, yes, that's uh, my uh, grandmother, uh, you see first with a little bag, and then my grandfather, he couldn't carry anything because he, uh, he, uh, he was ill, he had a, a stroke before that. My father behind me with two big suitcases, and there I am with uh, my little um, school satchel uh, bag, and uh, you see a little tag on it, probably said Kurt Meyer Kippenheim, and that's how we went into the truck. I think my who is, brother... And who is the girl that was watching you? The little girl was a neighbor girl. And um, years later, when I went back to Germany, I go back every year to give talks. The little girl, the woman grown up said, I'm Clara. I was little Clara when you... And uh, on that picture, and I remember you being taken away. If you look very closely at the extreme left, you see people standing almost like on a little stair. They were all standing there, neighbors, uh, looking, what's happening? Why are the police here? Why are the, uh, the military police here to pick up these Jewish people? Hmm. So what did you think was going to happen with you? What did, what did, your, what did your parents and, and you talk about? No one had any idea what was going to happen. Uh, some people thought, oh, this is really Nazi harassment of Jews. Some people said, why pack a lot of stuff in a suitcase? They'll send us back in a few days again. This is just uh, harassment. But um, then we all ended up with the, with the trucks and uh, at the railroad station, loaded under the train. And I remember an SS officer saying to my father, take your war veterans pin off. It won't help you. Uh, my father was a veteran of World War I and, and had a veteran's badge. But uh, the officer said, take it off. It's not, it won't help you at all. Mm -hmm. So you were taken to Gers, uh, which was a, a concentration camp basically in, yes. in, 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 in France. Uh, tell us a little bit about the conditions there and what, uh, what, that, what, what was happening there. Just to give an idea to our friends here where Gers is, uh, was located, it was almost on the Spanish border. All the way, the train went all the way two, three days through France. Uh, we had no uh, provisions except sandwiches we took with us. Ended up in Gers. Uh, everyone who survived Gers will remember mud, rain, every day mud and rain. And uh, there was a men's section separated from the women's section by barbed wire. Uh, the men's camp and the women's camp. My brother was older. He was with the, in the men's camp with my father. I was with my mother and grandmother in the women's camp. And uh, there was very little food. It was always cold. Uh, we slept on the floor. There were no mattresses, uh, no bedding, of course, a little stove in the middle of the barrack. And uh, what did people do? They uh, commiserated each other. They uh, tried to comfort each other. Oh, dear God will help us someday. Let's pray. That's all you could do. And that, but Gers was not a camp where people were beaten up, shot, murdered. It was just a holding camp until Auschwitz was ready to receive people. Auschwitz was being built at that time. Therefore, Gers was a holding camp, but it was, uh, there was certainly no food, not enough food, and there was a lot, a lot of illnesses. 
So let's, let's take the lens a little bit back. And so Michael, your book, you look mm -hmm. at the stories of a handful of families, um, right. uh, Kurt's family, but also a number of others. And some mm -hmm. obviously were able to make it to America. Right. Fortunately, Kurt, others were sent to Auschwitz. Yep. So tell us a little bit about you know, the differences between these stories and why, in fact, you know, Kurt's family was successful right. eventually in getting out. Well, a lot of people had been leaving before uh, 1940. I mean, this is, we're talking about, the, there was a small group of people, actually of only about 31 Jews were deported from Kippenheim uh, in October 1940. Many had succeeded in leaving before, and usually it was the younger people who succeeded in leaving, and in many cases it was the older people who remained behind uh, and who were deported to Gers in uh, in October 1940. Um, but everybody wanted to get out, I and mean, some of the people that I talk about in the book, write about in the book, there's a family who sent their uh, daughter to um, London on the kinder transport. Everybody had to make a decision about whether they remained together as a family or whether they split up, and some took this very painful decision of sending their children out on kinder transports. Uh, there's another family uh, that I talk about in the book uh, who tried to get to Cuba on the St. Louis, a um, very famous incident, were turned back from Cuba and then sailed up the coastline of Florida, couldn't come to the United States either, uh, and ended up, fortunately for them, in England rather than on the continent, because many of the people who ended up from the uh, St. Louis, uh, who, was, who, who uh, were uh, taken to France and Belgium, they were later uh, rounded up during the Holocaust. But for the particular family that I looked at, uh, they ended up in England and were able to get, reach America from England. So there are many different fates and many different uh, ways out. Um, for the people who were transported to Gers, I mean, there were essentially three different fates. There was the fate of uh, Kurt Meyer and some of the other lucky ones who, received, who continued, they transferred their visa applications that they'd made in Germany. They transferred them to the US consulate in Marseille and uh, they were given appointments at the consulate in Marseille and for a brief time, it was possible to escape from uh, Vichy, France and uh, get out uh, Marseille, Kurt's family went from Marseille to Casablanca to New York. Um, a lot of people died in the camps. Kurt's uh, grandfather died in, in Gers. Um, and then the people who didn't succeed in getting out uh, and were still there in the summer of 1942, uh, by this time German policy had changed from forcible expulsions to extermination and anybody who was left were then uh, put on trains from the south of France to Drancy and then to Auschwitz. So about half those 6,500 Jews that I talked about uh, that were sent to Gers, half of them ended up in Auschwitz and about only about 15% made it to the United States. Okay, so in the period that you're talking about this, maybe a year and a half or so after the deportation until I guess shortly after Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. uh, Many of the families are, have visa applications with yeah. the U.S. government. And the U.S. government, the, the consulate there is still interviewing refugees right. and so forth. Tell us, you know, what were the predominant factors for yeah. the U.S. authorities in evaluating these claims? What was kind of in their minds right. as, they, uh, as they evaluated who could come to the United States and who yeah. they would not accept? Well, this is where you see the connection between these two parallel storylines in my book. There's the story of what happened to the people in Germany and then in France, and the story of what was happening in the United States. Uh, and the two plots are connected with each other because there did be an event that took place in the United States that affected whether or not people got visas in Germany and France. Um, for example, after the invasion of France in June 1940, there was a whole, uh, what was called in the US, fifth column mania. Everybody thought that the reason for uh, Germany's military conquests in Western Europe uh, 
was the presence of fifth columnists and Nazi agents behind the lines. And this was taken very seriously by the US government, and one of their fears was that among the refugees coming to the United States, there could be Nazi agents disguised as Jewish refugees. So after the summer of 1940, it became more difficult to receive visas. There were extra checks were imposed. And uh, then, I mean, there's another family that I look at, um, the uh, family of, uh, they're called Max and Fanny Valfa, um, who several times came very close to receiving a visa. But then something would, some event would intervene which prevented them from receiving a visa. They were told, for example, to report uh, to the US consulate in Marseille on the 8th of December, 1941. The day before, they were meant to arrive at the consulate, and you see a photograph of the consulate up on the screen there, and stand in line and hopefully receive their visas. Um, the uh, Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, the United States entered the war, and uh, suddenly their visas were effectively canceled, or they weren't canceled, but they were told that they would have to be subjected to extra checks. They became what was known as enemy aliens. Even though they were Jews persecuted by Hitler, they were German citizens in the eyes of the US government. So again, they lost their chance to get a visa. And uh, in the end, six months later, Max and Fanny Valfer were deported, along with many others, to uh, Drancy and then to Auschwitz. Kurt, tell us a little bit about your family's efforts to get visas, but particularly, you went not straight from Gers, but to uh, Marseille, then to Casablanca, and then to America. Why this circuitous route? We had, we had uh, my family had relatives in Texas, uh, old time relatives who emigrated to the United States uh, before World War I, 1890s, 1900. And we were always in touch with the Texas folks and uh, we were able to get uh, visa applications in Germany. We went to Stuttgart and uh, applied, but then the deportations began and then um, we were in Gurs. And what do we do? How do we contact? We can't write to Germany. Uh, how, where do you get a, a, a postage stamp to write to the United States? Ink and, and paper and a pen. Uh, it was all very difficult. When I go to Germany every year to give talks, I tell the uh, young people in schools, I say, everything would have been easy if we had what? Email. <laughs> but Steve Jobs' parents weren't even born yet. So uh, everything would have been easy with email, but we had to do it the hard way, uh, write a letter. There was no air mail to the United States. Therefore, you had to wait for a ship to carry it. And, and the Atlantic was full of German U-boats. It was just a matter of luck that a letter reached to the relatives in Texas. They wrote to the State Department, and that's how things got rolling. So the key thing was that they said that they would sponsor you, and so yes. they, that, that was one of the key it was, uh, variables, right? In order to emigrate to the United States, uh, not only did you have to have a visa, you had to have a sponsor in the United States who said, I will be financially responsible for this emigrant. He won't be a public charge. He won't go on welfare. We will pay all his bills. So there was a lot of bureaucracy that way. Okay. So then uh, tell us a little bit about uh, being in, uh, how did you, Remind, remind the, tell the audience what, why you had to go to Casablanca first. You were on a ship first that was supposed to go well, to America, uh, but then that didn't. Just to go. tell the audience, you saw the line, uh, the long line in front of the American consulate. We came there uh, to join the line, but we had a French relative with us who was a French war veteran. He took us right to the, uh, to the policeman at the gate and showed his war veteran ID, and that's how we got in. We were able to skip this long line and go to the American consulate. Then I say to myself years later, 
We got to the head of the line. What about the poor people in the back? They didn't make it. They might, we might have taken their chance away. And that's how we uh, got an American uh, visa. They took us, uh, we were able to get uh, on a boat that went through the Mediterranean, past Gibraltar, to give you an idea, French Morocco. We reached Casablanca, trucks waiting for us again in the harbor, uh, get into the trucks, and they took us to a camp about 40, 50 miles from Casablanca, and there was a little uh, internment camp. We were there, but there was plenty of food. We were not treated badly. We, it was just a camp. Wait there until there's a ship for America. Then they told us, uh, you can go to Casablanca the, and, and get on board the ship in the harbor. That's how we got here. And what was the name of the ship that took you? Uh, was it ne the, Wy one, the original one was the Wyoming? Was the it? Wyoming, right. Wyoming. And, Wyoming. and um, the Nyasa eventually. Uh, and later. we were on two, Nyasa and the, the, the Wyoming. And I remember as we crossed the Atlantic, this was not a love boat. It was not a luxury liner. Uh, it was a passenger boat packed with refugees. Uh, as we got close to um, uh, British um, Island, uh, Bermuda, Bermuda, British uh, warship came along. Uh, British Marines boarded the vessel, inspected the papers of people, and then we overnight the boat uh, stayed in the harbor, and then the next morning we left, and a few days later we reached New York City. How did you, what, did you, what was your feeling when you arrived in America? <laughs> uh, great uh, relief that we finally made it. But um, we always thought of, what about the poor people who couldn't make it? We mm. weren't exactly uh, jubilant and happy. We, and if I could interject here, in fact, you left friends of yours uh, on the dock or behind in Marseille who had also been hoping to, there were uh, people to get out. There people who came with us to the harbor with a visa. I think they had even an American visa, but the French policeman said, the back of your visa lacks a stamp from the harbor police. Therefore, you have to stay. The boat left, and they were left behind, and um, they perished in Auschwitz. Just like, um, as Dorothy Thompson, uh, the newspaper woman said, a piece of paper with a stamp on it meant the difference between life and death. Michael, I want to ask you a broader question, because much of your book uh, focuses on the debates in Washington mm -hmm. over refugee policy. And uh, this is a subject which the museum itself has delved in deeply in the uh, exhibition and in other fora. Uh, what's your takeaway, in particular about FDR? Tell us a little bit about the FDR that emerges, because he's been much criticized in some quarters and much uh, praised in other quarters. How do you, how did you, what did you come away with right. from thinking about FDR? Well, with the quota system, immigration system had been introduced back in the 1920s after the First World War, and there was a widespread xenophobia, anti-Semitism in the United States that led to an immigration system being put in place that included restrictive quotas, um, particularly for Asians, uh, but also East Europeans. Actually, the German quota was not was was fairly generous relative to some of the other quotas. Um, but at question of how FDR uh, and the U.S. administration, uh, the immigration policy, of course, is a very controversial one, and uh, there are very strong uh, points of view on both sides. Um, I've tried to tell the story relate events as they happened. Um, I neither defend FDR nor do I attack him. It's not a polemical book. Um, I've tried to explain why he took decisions, what were the dilemmas that he faced. Uh, for example, I mean, there was a, I've tried to explain his goals at different times. I think it's fair to say that there's not a consistent policy. It's a different policy in 1938, 1939, 1940, 
when the quotas were actually filled than in the early 30s when you had the uh, continuation of a, what, what had been a very restrictive policy based on excluding anybody who could possibly be uh, a public burden uh, on the government. Then later on in 1940, new issues arose. Uh, the issue of national security, the consideration that uh, refugees might be a national security threat to the United States. And then when America entered the war, a whole new set of considerations um, uh, were uh, considered. Um, I mean, you have to think of FDR, first and foremost, he was a politician, and he was juggling many different goals. Um, for, he wanted to bring America into the war, but he wanted to bring the country with him. Um, and he feared that if uh, he was perceived as going against public opinion in the question of refugees and immigration, that might jeopardize his other goal, which was to bring, uh, first of all, to support uh, Britain and the other Western democracies in their fight against uh, uh, Nazi Germany, and then eventually to bring the United States into the war. And at the same time, he was facing a re-election campaign himself in the middle of all this, almost at the same time that uh, this deportation occurred to, um, uh, to Gers. Uh, FDR was running for re-election. So you have, he's a politician with all these things going uh, on in his head. Um, as I say, I haven't tried to defend him, I haven't tried to attack him, I've tried to explain and tell events as they actually unfolded. Let me ask you about one issue, uh, which is the issue of anti-Semitism. And there's been much written over about this period, that the, about this anti-Semitism in the State Department. Your book probably, I would say, discusses that a little bit, but in some ways puts more emphasis on concerns of national security that were animating some of the key State Department officials. What do you think about the relative uh, role of, of anti-Semitism in, in explaining the American response? Well, anti-Semitism and xenophobia in general were undoubtedly part of the background for the introduction of these quotas in the 1920s. Um, they're probably also um, part of the explanation for the restrictive application of the quotas in the early 1930s. Um, by uh, 1940, I mean, the, when you're trying to explain why somebody gets a visa or they don't, it's very hard to pin it on some anti-Semitic view of, uh, of a consul. It's usually there's something else involved, particularly uh, this question of uh, national security. But sort of anti-Semitism is a kind of late motif. Um, and you can't put all the consuls and all the pe members of the US government into one, um, I I into, into one category. And there were some who were more sympathetic to, to refugees, some who were less sympathetic. I thought I might actually, though, uh, read a comment from one consul in Marseille, which sort of illustrates the attitude of, of, um, of some of the uh, consuls at the time. His name is William Peck, and um, he, was, uh, he wrote a memorandum actually defending the consulate in Marseille from charges of laxity. He says, I do not subscribe to the school of thought which advocates refusing visas to all persons whose faces we do not like on some flimsy pretext, nor was he in favor of turning down applicants whose paperwork was not entirely complete. The consul interpreted humanitarian considerations to mean favoring older refugees, especially those in the camps. He saw little risk in granting visas to the elderly and chronically sick. These are the real sufferers and the ones who are dying off, he wrote. The young ones may be suffering. He's talking about Jewish uh, refugees here. But the history of their race shows that suffering does not kill many of them. Furthermore, the old people will not reproduce and can do our country no harm, provided there is adequate evidence of support. Um, so, I mean, that's a rather what most of us would consider an ugly sentiment that will accept the old people because they will not reproduce. But I do think it reflects the attitude, rather sort of paternalistic, rather snobbish attitude of at least 
you know, some U.S. consuls uh, in Europe at the time. Kurt, uh, have, as you've reflected upon this period, do you have any thoughts to add to what Michael said, just about your views about uh, the actions of, your, of the government that you came well, to be a citizen uh, of? Well, um, speaking mostly about government bureaucracy, and I want to mention that when we came to the United States, the bureaucracy didn't end. Uh, all, um, uh, all the people who came here uh, were issued a little book, had a red cover, it said Department of Justice, uh, State Dep uh, Department, and uh, FBI. Uh, why did they give us this little book with uh, our picture and uh, photograph and, uh, and fingerprint? Uh, if we wanted to travel, say from New York to Philadelphia, we were supposed to notify the Justice Department. They didn't, again, the support to you. Uh, what you said about afraid of uh, fifth columnists, Nazi spies. And I mentioned the other day that um, Toscanini, who was, an who was Italian, considered an enemy alien, even though he was the most famous conductor in the United States at that time. When he traveled with his orchestra, he had to report uh, he was taking the orchestra to uh, uh, Boston. Uh, yes, I'm going to Boston. I need permission from the Justice Department. Kurt, tell us what happened to your family after you came to America. So you came to New York in 1942? 41. 41. 41. And so what, what happened? Uh, well, we lived in the South Bronx uh, in the neighborhood with other uh, German-Jewish um, uh, families. Uh, there were synagogues, again, where the sermon was still in German, not in English, and uh, because most people didn't understand English. Uh, there were uh, quite a few in, in, in the South Bronx. Um, people had a tough time getting well-paying jobs. Most of the people couldn't find uh, well-paying jobs. Uh, porters, elevator operators, delivery men, that kind of work was available. And for women, household cleaning, cleaning other people's apartments and so on. And, uh, but most of the German Jews who came to New York lived in Washington Heights. If you can imagine the George Washington Bridge from New York, uh, from Manhattan to New Jersey, that was the uh, uh, center of uh, German Jewish emigres, and uh, there were German um, uh, bakeries and butcher shops and uh, a lot of synagogues. And as a matter of fact, the German Jews who always had a good sense of humor said, so many of us are here. Even a German Jewish newspaper was published. So many of us here. We are the beginning of the Fourth Reich, they said. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> So, and, and your father, what did your father do? My father worked in a factory. Uh, my mother uh, wa worked in a leather goods factory making wallets uh, uh, with a, a sewing machine. Okay. None now, of them had uh, big jobs. Right. Now, you go back to Germany, I believe, every year, pretty much, and uh, you often talk to school children. Tell, tell us a little bit about those conversations with, with, with kids in Germany today. Well, when I... Uh, I've been doing this for 18 years. Every October I go back to, uh, why do I go in October? Because the deportations began in October 22nd, 1940. Therefore, there's always a big ceremony on October 22nd in southwest Germany at a place. And I uh, speak in schools. And one of the first questions I ask students, most of them are, 14, 16, 17 years old. I say, the height of the Jewish population in Germany was in 1933. Who knows what was the population of Jewish, uh, Jewish population of Germany? Finally, somebody, five million, eight million, 10 million. They hear these fantastic numbers, and then I say, it was a little le more than 500,000, less than one half percent of the German population. They're always surprised. 
And that's how we, I, I always take a lot of pictures with me, photographs, and show them just as the, uh, if you've seen here. And uh, that leads into uh, conversations. The last uh, few years, I noticed a lot of Muslim students. And uh, in some classes, they look away. They don't want to make eye contact. But uh, uh, last year, a Muslim girl with a headscarf came up to me and, and after the talk and said, uh, Mr. Maha Maya, can I hug you? And that made, was a good feeling that a Muslim uh, girl hugged me. Michael, you went back with uh, Kurt on one of those visits right. just, about, two uh, about two years ago. Um, uh, and we started uh, our discussion. I think we, I haven't seen all the images, but there, but there were some images of, uh, you know, what happened in Kippenheim with the Nazi pogrom and stuff. Yeah. And uh, you've now written a bit in the book about right. the, how the synagogue in, uh, in Kippenheim has changed hands a number of times. Uh, tell, tell, tell the audience a little bit about what's happened here. Yeah, the last chapter in the book is about, it's called Memory, and it's all about this rediscovery of memory, uh, rediscovery of history uh, in the last 40 years, because I think uh, for 40, 50 years, uh, most Germans didn't want to talk about uh, what had happened during the Holocaust at all, and it took a new generation um, coming of age to, for really a serious historical discussion to take place. And you see this on a very small scale in Kippenheim, uh, the uh, synagogue after the war had been turned into an agricultural warehouse and it was stripped of all its, um, there you see it there on the screen, um, it was, uh, the towers were taken down, the rosette uh, uh, window was um, blocked up and it was used for the storage of uh, feed and grain and uh, that was, as actually one of the Germans who lives around Kippenheim says, there was, more destruction of the synagogue took place during the democratic period after the war than, um, during, than, than at Kristallnacht or during the war. Um, but after about 40 years, during the 70s and 80s, um, both um, for, as a result of pressure from former Jewish residents of Kippenheim, but also local people, uh, they started saying, well, you know, this building is a not just a part of Jewish history, it's a part of um, our history. And there was a campaign to rebuild the synagogue. Um, they had to raise a lot of money, um, at least a million dollars, but, and it took 20 years, but the synagogue was rebuilt. And then the people in the village began reaching out to the former Jewish, um, former Kippenheim Jews, uh, tracking them all over the world and inviting them including Kurt, to come back to uh, Kippenheim and to um, you know, attempt to make amends or attempt at reconciliation after everything had happened. Um, and, they, they, and now the synagogue is rebuilt. It's, they invite Kurt and uh, other people back every year. Um, in, so f in terms of you know, exploring these incredibly painful episodes in their history, um, the Germans have uh, probably done as much as any other country in the world. Michael, there's a very moving passage at the end of your book, the last paragraph or two, that I thought it might be yeah. interesting for you to read, maybe set up a little bit, because yeah. it talks about these challenges of memory, and maybe, maybe both you and Kurt could also reflect on this before we turn it over to audience questions. I will remind people I have a bunch of questions here, but if people have other questions, uh, don't hesitate to give them uh, to, the, to the staff of the Holocaust Museum, and we'll, we'll try to answer them. Right, so actually I had the privilege of going to Kippenheim a couple of years ago with Kurt, and Kurt showed me around the village. He showed me his uh, home, uh, and he also pointed out, if uh, those of you who have been to Germany might have seen them, they're little memorial tablets, metal tablets that are in the uh, pavement. They're called Stolpersteine, um, which commemorate the Jews who used to live in a certain place, and there are a number of Stolpelsteiner all over um, Kippenheim. So um, I'm saying that Kurt himself didn't want to have a Stolperstein installed outside his former house himself, but he pointed out the memorial tablets to other Kippenheim Jews, including those for Max and Fanny Valfer, uh, 
who were both killed at Auschwitz. The Walfus House, across the street from the renovated synagogue on Poststrasse, was now inhabited by a family of Kurdish refugees from Syria who had fled their homeland because of the brutal civil war. The front room, where Max ran his wholesale tobacco business, had been transformed into a takeaway kebab shop. Apart from Kurt and me, no one paid attention to the two matching metal tablets discreetly cemented into the adjacent sidewalk. The Stolperstein for Fanny read simply, Here wohnte, here lived Fanny Walfer, born 1886, deported to Gers, 1940, murdered, 1942, Auschwitz. The memorials to Fax, Max and Fanny Walfer prompted Kurt to reflect on his family's good fortune in obtaining the piece of paper with the stamp that was the difference between life and death in Dorothy Thompson's phrase. In the case of the Meyer family, there was more than just one stamp on the all-important piece of paper. The reverse side of their American visa was adorned with a multitude of stamps and signatures reflecting the family's roundabout odyssey from Kippenheim to Gers to Marseille to Casablanca, and finally in August 1941 to New York. The absence of a single stamp condemned the refugees to endless bureaucratic purgatory and often to death. This was the most precious document I ever possessed, said Kurt. Those stamps saved our lives. And I have a photograph right after that in the back of the book of the Maya family visa, which shows the visa with all the stamps on it. And uh, that is actually a photograph that Kurt also uses uh, in his talks in Germany. So it summarizes his good fortune and the tragedy of many other mm -hmm. Kippenheimers who didn't make it. Kurt, any, any reflections on that final passage? I think Michael has expressed it perfectly. I okay. have nothing to add. <clears throat> okay, I have a lot of questions here from the audience, and uh, as I said, people can keep sending them. I do want to just, uh, uh, a bunch of questions on immigration, which I'll come to. I did want to just, uh, there's one question, Michael, for you about the role of anti-Semitism in the State Department, which you touched upon a little bit, and specifically the question of Breckenridge Long, who yeah. was uh, the Assistant Secretary of State, who uh, oversaw the immigration, you know, policymaking who was an avowed anti-Semite. And uh, uh, really the question is wondering whether you might be minimizing his role in this. Well, there's quite a lot about Breckenridge Long in the book. Um, he was running the uh, refugee policy from the State Department. And um, of course, he wasn't the only person involved. Um, he, in June of 1940, I mentioned after the fall of France, uh, he introduced um, uh, new regulations that made it much more difficult uh, to fill these quotas. In fact, he gave instructions that said that uh, to the consuls that said, if in the case of any doubt whatsoever, uh, the refugees should not be admitted to the U.S. And anti-Semitism was not the uh, pretext for this, at least in publicly. Uh, it was um, the fear of Nazi agents and uh, fifth columnists. But you know, there was a battle going on in the U.S. administration. Then there was, you know, F, uh, people like Breckenridge Long were on one side, and somebody like Eleanor Roosevelt was on another. And so it's not consistent. And at sometimes um, uh, the gates open a little, and then they close. Um, actually, after June 1940, uh, very few people got in for a few months, and then it opened a little. Among the people who got in were Kurt and his family. So. Um, it's important to remember there's a, a bureaucratic battle going on that I describe. And uh, each side of the battle are using the press to denounce the other side. Um, and uh, so this is one of the things that I describe in the book. Um, it's, it's not a simple story. It's a, quite a complicated story. Right. Uh, a question for really either of you, but the question is, why were the Kippenheim Jews put in Gers, which as a reader asked, was in southern France and very far away from, uh, wh why were they sent to Gers as opposed to some other camp? Um, that was uh, <clears throat> really a local action. The Gauleiter of Baden uh, wanted to make himself uh, liked in Berlin with the Nazi party. 
he really undertook this on his own initiative, said uh, to local police, we're going to round up all the Jews in Baden and send them off, pack them off. Where? We can't... Uh, we'll send them to un uh, occupied France, to the... Uh, the Germans have conquered France. We'll send them off to France. The French, when we crossed the French border, they didn't know who was coming. They had no idea. They thought, uh, they thought there was a German population, just German people being deported. So it was a complete surprise to them. And then they said, where are we going to put them? And there was already a camp uh, in Gurs, which was, as I mentioned, close to the uh, Spanish border. Rem you must remember also there was a civil war, Fra Franco, General Franco, a civil war in Spain. A lot of Spanish people fled to France. The French didn't know what to do with them. They said, oh, here's our open space. We'll give them building material. And the Spanish refugees built this Camp Gus for the Spanish people. Then came the Jewish people there. So everything was in a state of flux, um, everyday different policies, bureaucracy. That's how we ended up in, in, in near the Spanish border rather than in Poland or in Russia. So here's a question I've been wondering about. It's for you, Kurt. Describe what it was like to be middle class and suddenly living in mud, no food, sleeping on the floor. Well, I didn't worry about my status symbol at that time, that I was middle class. <laughs> um, it's just that uh, th these people were who people living in, in their own home, in their apartments, uh, given two hours to pack their bags and, uh, and didn't know what was going to happen to them. Um, I was in a barrack with women, only women. I was a little boy, therefore they put me in the women's barrack. And all night I could hear them crying and, and comforting each other. Please, God will help us. Don't cry. Things will get better. That's the things I heard for half a year. I was uh, half a year from October till the spring in, in this camp. And um, uh, I became ill uh, with a disease that's not even known today anymore, hardly. Diphtheria. Ask your great grandmother; she can tell you about diphtheria. And there was a little girl uh, in the uh, barrack with me who became ill. She had the same disease, diphtheria, and um, we both recovered. And uh, the little girl, the mother of the little girl, gave me the photograph of the girl and her mother, and wrote on the back a souvenir from Gus. January 1941, uh, after having recovered from diphtheria. I have that photograph at home. It's been reproduced widely in other books. And, uh, but I still have the original one, and that I'm going to get, donate to the museum. Great. Yeah. All right, so there's a number of questions here about immigration policy. Let me just start with a question that comes from someone who terms uh, him or herself, a child of Holocaust immigrants in our audience asks, mm -hmm. my parents had no sponsor and were held at Ellis Island for eight months. They finally went to Canada and only entered the U.S. years later. Mm -hmm. Why was it easier to enter Canada? Or was it? Well, I'd have to know exactly what the date was yeah. and the a bit more of the circumstances. I mean, I wouldn't say that in general it was easier to enter Canada. I mean, perhaps for some people it was easier to enter Canada. Um, and the U.S. did take more uh, refugees than any other country, and particularly during this period. Actually, in the early 30s, uh, more went to Palestine, but in the late 30s and early 40s, uh, more Jewish refugees came to the U.S. than any other country in the world. But certainly, and that's not to say that um, a lot of people who should have come here were 
denied entry, and that's also undoubtedly true. Um, a lot of people, uh, because the quotas were filled, or later on they weren't being filled, uh, they ended up in what were called waiting countries, in between countries, including Britain. Um, so there are a lot of, uh, some people from Kippenheim ended up in, uh, went to Britain, and then later came to the US after the war. Um, so, you know, there were many, many routes to the US, but the bottom line is that, um, uh, you know, it's a kind of glass half full, glass half empty story. There are many people who, who could have been saved if they'd been granted American visas, and I describe many of these stories in the book, but there are also people who did succeed in reaching the United States. Um, you know, we have to think about both the people who made it and the people who didn't make it. A couple more questions. Uh, this actually predates the book, Michael, but maybe you might have a thought about this, which is about the Evian Conference of July 1938, yeah. uh, which is discussed in the permanent exhibition upstairs. Uh, why were the results so meager from, yeah. that, from that conference? Well, in 38, when the refu European refugee crisis, which was mainly a Jewish crisis, um, started um, becoming extremely serious. Uh, President Roosevelt wanted to do something about it, but he, d he wanted everybody, as he put it, to bear their fair share of the burden. So the aim of this conference that he uh, was behind, largely behind, that was called in a little town of Evian in France, uh, was to get everybody to bear their fair share, what the Americans considered their fair share of the burden. Um, but when it came down to it, you know, uh, although the rhetoric was, uh, there's a lot of rhetoric about accepting refugees, in practice, very little was done. Um, I mean, at that time, Roosevelt's main goal was to find another homeland for Jews apart from Palestine, because the British were already closing the doors of Palest uh, to Palestine making it more difficult to emigrate to Palestine. So uh, the US government was looking for other places in the world, not just the United States, where Jews could immigrate to. All right, final question for either of you. Was, was there any legislation or efforts created to assimilate the, in, the incoming refugees in the United States? So things to make it easier for Kurt's family, for instance, to uh, assimilate? What do you think? As far as I remember, there was no program uh, at all, no government-sponsored program, no. Uh, you could go to evening school and learn English. That's a, in po local public schools, but that's about all. Uh, remember, we came here uh, without any funds, money, and we lived through the generosity of relatives and then getting our own jobs. It was not easy. I just want to, since we speak about emigration to, the, to these various countries which closed their borders, there was one country where you didn't need a visa. All you needed was money. What country was that? Shanghai, China. A lot of Jews ended up in Shanghai, China. And uh, uh, that saved their lives there. Okay, I'm going to ask one final question because I don't think there are any other questions. Are there more questions? Okay, this is the last question for both of you. Is uh, I'll just read this specifically. What do you hope American readers will learn from this book to help them reflect on U.S. leadership today? <laughs> I'm just I'm reading the question. <laughs> do you want to go first, Kurt? <laughs> or uh, I, otherwise I can go first. I mean, it's not... Uh, I've written a history book, uh, not a policy book. And um, you know, the question of how we handle refugees and immigrants is a very complicated question, of which uh, the people quite legitimately have strong feelings um, on either side. And I've, one of the researching this topic um, you know, has made me understand the complexity of the question. But, and also, researching it, there are many I mean, if you read the book, you'll find many echoes of our current day uh, debates about immigration and refugees. I don't think you can just take the situation in the 30s and 40s uh, 
and applied it to America today. It's, uh, uh, it's not exactly similar. History does not repeat itself precisely. Um, but as Sarah Bloomfield, the um, uh, president, the leader of the Holocaust Museum, says in her introduction to the book, she quotes Mark Twain, who said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And uh, so when you read the book, you'll find many ways in which history rhymes, but doesn't exactly repeat itself. Agree with that. You agree with that? <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank everyone for joining the program today. Before closing, I want to just say three things. One is just to remind people that Michael will be available to sign copies of the book uh, upstairs uh, after the program. So if you want to buy a book and have Michael sign it, this is your opportunity. Uh, also, I'd like to ask folks to please visit the Americans in the Holocaust exhibition, which offers a portrait of really these issues we've been discussing, of, of the United States in the 30s and 40s, and it's really intended to help visitors understand the pressures and fears that influence decision makers uh, uh, by everyday Americans and their leaders. And finally, the museum has a podcast that goes deeper into this history. It's called 12 Years That Shook the World, and examines the impact of the Holocaust and introduces you to lesser known and fascinating insights. So you can listen to that podcast on, our, on, the, web, on the museum's website or download it on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And I would also just like to ask everyone to join me in giving a round of applause to our speakers. For really fascinating